Thanks. The Honorable Ranil Wickramasinghe, President of Sri Lanka, and Professor, Professor Maitri Wickramasinghe, the Secretary General of the Commonwealth, the Right Honorable Patricia Scotland, King's Council, the Honorable Ministers, Excellencies of the High Commissions, Embassies, and other members of the Di Diplomatic Corps, distinguished guests. On behalf of the geopolitical cartographer, it is indeed my pleasure to welcome everyone to our inaugural lecture. The Geopolitical Cartographer is a research foundation specializing in the Indian Ocean. It aims to promote the study, research, and analysis of the geopolitical, geoeconomic, and maritime affair developments in the Indian Ocean, Pacific Ocean, and the connected landmass, which are redrawing the global political order. As we begin today, I would like to welcome our founder and our patron, who since the geopolitical cartographer was started, has taken on a truly noble task of trying to envision a new Sri Lanka. It is indeed my honor to welcome my boss, the founder and patron, and now president, the Honorable Ranil Wickramasinghe. the Secretary General of the Commonwealth, Honorable the Ministers, Mr. Karu Jayasuriya, Your Excellencies and Friends. It gives me great pleasure to be present here today with Patricia Scotland, the Secretary General of the Commonwealth, for the inaugural lecture of the Geopolitical Cartographer. The Geopolitical Cartographer is the outcome of a discussion of firstly of uh, increasing the number of think tanks and research institutes in the country. Secondly, to focus on international affairs. Thirdly, not merely to cover the whole range of international affairs, but to focus on an area which was of concern to us, where we are located, the Indian Ocean. Its geopolitical aspects, its uh, geoeconomic aspects, its environmental aspects, which fall into either geopolitical or geoeconomic. And, and it was called the geopolitical cartographer because now the maps are drawn and boundaries are drawn, not according to geography, but according to geopolitics. For a long time, we belonged to a region known as the Indian Ocean. And all of a sudden, it became the Indo-Pacific. So that is geopolitical cartography. The same thing, Europe has a problem now of where to draw the boundaries between Russia and Ukraine. It, it keeps changing throughout the world. Various claims are made. But we have to learn now that cartography depends completely on geopolitics and nothing else. So we call the name geopolitical cartographer, uh, but was to discuss how geopolitics and geoeconomics was changing the Indian Ocean, the most vital ocean uh, in the world. Till about the 18th century, this was also the richest. 
and in time to come before end of the century again you will find first the development of south asia of indonesia and southeast asia of uh, the middle east and finally the big development explosion in africa we might we be that's why the focus is completely on this new emerging region and the first person to come here and to be invited here is none other than the secretary general of the commonwealth she has been a good friend of sri lanka she has been a good friend of asia and africa and she represents our thinking but there is also another reason for her to be here for the commonwealth to be here when we got independence we first joined the commonwealth we were admitted to the commonwealth i entered to the un was blocked because uh, us had blocked some of the soviet countries in return the soviet union blocked sri lanka it was only in 1955 that we became a member of the united nations but from the beginning we have been with the commonwealth and it is only correct that the secretary general of the commonwealth should be here on our 75th anniversary of independence you were there when you got independence and you are here now so it is to mark that occasion as she was invited here by the government to take part in the uh, 75th anniversary of our independence but today you are not here to listen to me speak you are here to see listen to what patricia has to say so i would like to welcome her uh, to address all of you on the numerous crises that she is going to now uh, explain and lay out thank you thank you sir for charting a course for us on this special occasion it is now my pleasure to introduce the secretary general of the commonwealth patricia scotland was born in the commonwealth of dominica she is the 10th of 12 children and grew up in london she completed her llb with honors from london university at the age of 20 and was called to the bar at middle temple at the age of 21 her career has been marked by achieving a number of extraordinary firsts not least of which was to be the first woman in more than the 700 year history of the office to serve as her majesty's attorney general for england and wales and for northern ireland while holding these and other senior ministerial office she was given responsibility inter alia for gender equality domestic violence forced marriage international child abduction and from these positions was promoted diversity and equality of opportunity particularly for women and girls as the only woman to have been appointed secretary general of the commonwealth she is placing special emphasis on mobilizing the 56 nations of the commonwealth to tackle climate change including its disproportionate impact on women and though and through young women's enterprise to build the resilience of smaller or more vulnerable countries eliminating domestic violence and violence against women and girls is another area of focus Please welcome the Secretary General of the Commonwealth the right honorable Patricia Scotland King's Counsel to deliver the inaugural lecture of titled The Role of the Commonwealth in an Era of Polycrisis thank you Your excellencies honorable ministers my dear commonwealth friends good evening is anyone out there good evening are you born vananakam may i say what a pleasure it is to be with you and personally thank if i may president uh, wakram singh for his kind invitation to join you here today and for sri lanka's deep friendship and commitment to the commonwealth this is my third visit to sri lanka 
since taking office as Secretary General. And this wonderful, beautiful Sri Lanka, famous and proud nation, situated in the very heart of the Indian Ocean, is very special to our family. A nation which ever since the decisive step into independence in 1948 has played a role in the world which outstrips its size. The Sri Lanka, which blazed a trail in electing the world's first woman prime minister. The Sri Lanka, which attained admirable high social indicators in areas such as literacy and infant mortality, and set an example to the world by eliminating malaria. The Sri Lanka, which helped to found the Commonwealth in 1949, which provided skilled diplomats of the highest order to the United Nations and the Commonwealth in service of the world, and which brought the Commonwealth together by hosting our heads of government meeting in 2013. The Sri Lanka, which showed its tremendous talents and prowess when it won the Cricket World Cup. Morali's record of 800 international wickets may never be broken, save except by a West Indian cricketer. <laughs> and I say that as the daughter of a West Indian cricketer who once had the privilege to play with Vivi Richards' father because they were best friends. So you can see why we think we'll give you a bit of run for your money. I know that Sri Lanka has felt, indeed continues to feel, the weight of political and economic pressure. I was privileged to talk to young people from Sri Lankan's Federation of Youth Clubs, and I really understand what they told me. Pressure can be hard to bear. It can be destabilizing, isolating, frightening. And I am here because I want every Sri Lankan to know that you are not alone. You are part of this special, precious Commonwealth family. As a family, we have a responsibility for one another, a duty to each other, a shared love and a shared journey. And you are not alone in the nature of the challenges you face. I travel all around the Commonwealth and the wider world. And whilst every country's direct experience and circumstances are different, there are similar challenges everywhere. You may feel as though you are living in a country under pressure. But the reality is that we are all living in a world under pressure, all of us, tightly bound by a tangled knot of crises spanning global systems, a world living with the social, political, and economic consequences of COVID-19, a world crippled by debt, rising inflation, and high interest rates, spiring costs of food and energy. We are grappling with the tremors of instability and conflict. And all the time, we are buffered by the increasingly harsh impacts of climate change. Each of these challenges can be categorized as grave and serious crises, 
taken together, they have been given a name, the poly crisis. The global crises interconnect, intertwine, and worsen one another. What we feel in our lives is the relationship between these crises and the unique political, economic, social, and geographical circumstances of the societies in which we live. The shocks are disparate, but they interact so the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. They combine and accelerate to amplify existing social, political, and economic inequalities and bring forward the tipping point for conflict. Their effect is acute bursts of pain, combined with the gradual worsening of collective human prospects. It is a grim reality that the world has faced grave challenges before. What defines our present predicament as unique is the lack of single causes and single fixes, and the way in which human activities have pushed the planet's ecological systems so far out of balance that all other global systems are in danger. From the production of food and energy to finance, trade, international security. What makes it so intractable is the dilemmas it creates. Where attempts to resolve one crisis worsens another. For example, when poverty reduction measures increase fossil fuel emissions, or where even the definition of a problem is contested, such as the conflict between nations and there is no clear path to resolution. How do we respond to these challenges? What role is there for the Commonwealth in the eye of such a storm. It is clear to me that meeting the poly crisis requires a level of international political and economic cooperation which is unprecedented in this century. Yet they are manifest at a time where the multilateral system is under huge I would say immense pressure. Indeed, the pressure that the poly crisis contribute to that pressure. And the world feels as though it is fracturing. And the increasingly polarized environment, people are anxious about the capacity of governments and international institutions to provide the leadership and action required. And it's exactly in that context like this that the Commonwealth can mobilize its greatest qualities because we are carbon. And when immense pressure is applied to carbon, it can create a multifaceted, complex, resilient, and magnificent diamond. And that diamond is our Commonwealth. We began as a group of eight, including Sri Lanka, brought together under the shadow of empire after the end of the Second World War and at the beginning of the Cold War to bring a touch of healing to relationships which were changing. Her late majesty, Queen Elizabeth II, herself observed that the Commonwealth, and I quote, which bears no resemblance to the empires of the past, 
an entirely new conception built on the highest qualities of the spirit of man. Friendship, loyalty, and the desire for freedom and peace and an equal partnership of nations and races. It's really important that we remember that was 1953 and the Commonwealth was the only international organization talking about equality between races. And I believe she was right. Today, the Commonwealth stands as a voluntary association of 56 independent sovereign states spread across five oceans, five uh, continents, and six oceans. 2.5 billion people, 60% of whom are under the age of 30. We encompass around one third of the world's population. We comprise developed and developing countries, island states and landlocked states, some of the largest populations of any country in the world, and some of the smallest, five of the 10 fastest growing cities on the planet, and some of the most remote indigenous communities. 33 of our members are small states, of which 25 are small island developing states. But look at the Indian Ocean. 14 of our members come from the Indian Ocean. 15 of our 56 members retain constitutional links with the monarchy of the United Kingdom. 36 are republics. Five have monarchies of their own. And four were never part of the British Empire. Most recently in Kigali, Togo and Gabon joined us. And that is an extraordinary thing to happen because they were welcomed by all of the heads of government in Kigali because it was the right place to be. Each is different with different history and different experiences, but each is united in active, engaged membership of the modern Commonwealth, bound by the blend of practical advantages, common interest, shared values, which makes the Commonwealth absolutely unique. And rising from all of this is an essential truth. We are the world's largest association of democratic nations and the most significant grouping of countries in the history of the world, which is bound above all by values to which we all aspire and the values enshrined in our beloved charter. The strength of our combination of advantages, interests, and values shines in the fact that whilst the multilateral system is under strain, the Commonwealth as a multilateral organization is growing precisely because of what we stand for and what we can deliver. We have never been greater in number than we are today. And many countries are asking, even now, to join us. So we know that the Commonwealth story has its origins in empire. At times, we still feel the scars of old hurts and resentments. But our ability to bring leaders together today as equals underlines our strength and value. The Commonwealth provides a continuous connection between countries separated by geography. In no other multilateral setting can Sri Lanka 
engage so regularly, so easily, so intimately, so closely to build relationships in Africa or the Caribbean or Europe or North America. We have difficult conversations in a constructive spirit and we face the world's challenges together. It is a unique organization in our world and it has been a hallmark of the Commonwealth. For decades, we have demonstrated a remarkable ability to confound our history and at difficult times to look crisis and challenge in the face and to call it what it is, to call injustice what it is. And we can see in our collective refusal to turn a blind eye to apartheid. You can see it in the groundbreaking Lusaka Declaration on Racism in 1979. You can see it in the Lankawi Declaration on the Environment in 1989. The leader's statement on climate change ahead of the Paris Agreement in 2015, it's so easy to forget that that Paris Agreement seemed so far away. And yet it was in Malta that we agreed to go together to Paris and fight for an enforceable agreement, two degrees and 1.5 degrees as our target, aspirationally. We did that in November. In Paris, what did they then agree? Enforceability, two degrees and a 1.5 aspirational target. But where was that deal for the world brokered? It was brokered around the table of our Commonwealth family because everybody was there. Everybody was represented. Everybody had their say. And then we look at the leader's statement and it echoed the hopes of the whole world, not just the hopes of our Commonwealth nations. And in the landmark reference to loss and damage in 2022 Chogham and Kigali, which was unique, but it set the tone in the global agreement that came in COP27. 27 years we had been asking about loss and damage, 27 years. And it was only when the Commonwealth leaders bravely put loss and damage in their communique that in Sham el Sheikh we heard the echo of the Commonwealth in the communique from the rest of the world and we delivered together, all of us, globally, loss and damage for the first time. So you can see in the Commonwealth Charter, which celebrates its 10th anniversary this year, and you can see it also in our continuous, tireless fight for the small and the vulnerable and the marginalized. These interventions have been groundbreaking and often shifted the dial. So today, in the face of the challenges which are thrust upon us, we must take courage to break new ground and shift the dial again. The collective resolve of Commonwealth heads of government to do exactly that, this um, was there once again in Kigali last year. And the credibility of leadership lies in our program of practical action, support and assistance for our member states, which is more comprehensive today than at any time in the last 74 years of our history. For the environment, we have the Blue Charter and our Living Lands Charter, which are unique, ambitious, principled, comprehensive, and member-led. And I would like to take this opportunity to commend Sri Lanka's leadership of the Mangrove Ecosystems and Livelihood Action Group 
of the Blue Charter, which has made such a significant difference to performance and attainment, and we have empirical evidence that this has made and been the difference that we needed to make. And our Climate Finance Access Hub has unlocked nearly $60 million worth of essential adaptation and mitigation finance for countries which most need it and which might otherwise struggle to access it. And that was achieved by a contribution of 1.5 million pounds, and we have almost $800 million worth of projects in the pipeline. And I'm proud that Sri Lanka will soon be able to access the full benefits of this work with the placement of a national climate finance advisor here in Sri Lanka. In the face of economic turbulence, debt and inflation, our state-of-the-art debt management system is now working across 43 countries to help them maximize the benefits of debt relief and generate management payment schedules. And our trade and investment advantages continue to be real examples of the benefits of Commonwealth membership. We may not be a formal trade bloc, but trade costs between our Commonwealth countries are 20% lower on average compared to trading with non-Commonwealth countries. And when we disagree, we disagree well, because it's 20% faster, easier, and cheaper to settle our disputes than it would otherwise be. And in intra-Commonwealth investment, that has had an increase of nearly 30% in the last seven years. So these are real concrete advantages delivered by working together. And through our Universal Vulnerability Index, we are helping to drive a more nuanced and constructive way of defining and measuring the vulnerabilities of nation states based not on outdated metrics, but on hard-headed assessments of each country's real resilience and identity and identify where the need is greatest. And our landmark anti-corruption benchmarks are actively helping governments and the public sector to assess laws, procedures, and actions against international good practice and make improvements if needed. And it's worth just reminding ourselves that the gap between what we have and what we need in order to meet the Sustainable Development Goals is the sum equivalent to that which is siphoned off by corruption. So when we interdict that corruption, we put money and power back into the hands of our governments. And our generally accepted principles for performance management developed through two years of painstaking engagement of thousands of leaders and senior civil servants are set to proceed through onto the United Nations towards a global consensus on government performance management. But they were agreed in Kigali in June by us first. And these... And these principles may not grab the headlines, but they are the mother of all reform and the foundation for good government. And this is one example of the Commonwealth leadership in the world. And through our Commonwealth Says No More campaign and our economic empowerment efforts, our work to end violence against women and to bring peace in our home and to enable women to participate fully in political life, in reaching more and more every day. And it is vital because there can be no peace, no true peace, no fair prosperity without women's safety and women's empowerment. And our work to protect the process, institutions, and culture of democracy, as well as our quiet, but 
but essential work on peace serves not just the Commonwealth, but the whole world. And this is the Commonwealth today in 2023. Our role, our relevance, our value, our principled and practical response to the grave challenges we all face. And there is another dimension to this argument. The very fact of the polycrisis shows us that for governments, multilateral institutions, businesses, and civil society, business as usual is simply not enough. It's not enough to deal with the challenges we are aware of, and not enough to deal with the new and unexpected challenges which will inevitably come our way. We cannot simply manage the impact of problems. We must seek to transcend and to build a better future, driven by a combination of hope, hard-headedness, and confidence in humanity's ingenuity. I've often said human genius got us into this mess, and human genius is going to have to get us out. Because during the last decade, the proliferation of challenges I have been describing has too often diverted our attention from a technological revolution which is dizzying in its pace and scale. More people are connected to the internet than ever before. More people rely on digital services than ever before. New technologies such as artificial intelligence, big data, blockchain, cloud computing, internet of things have become critical to nearly every sector. They are driving profound changes in our daily lives, changing how we consume, produce, and work, how societies connect, and how businesses are run. By the end of this decade, it will have completely transformed our societies and our economies. So it will inevitably transform our politics too. But if you talk to most public policymakers about the technological revolution right now, today, you will probably find yourself in a conversation about how to effectively regulate Facebook or debate about whether Elon Musk is going or doing a good job on Twitter. Now, these conversations are important, but they miss the wider point, and they sidestep the purpose. What we should be talking about and what we can no longer avoid talking about is how we can harness the extraordinary potential of technological transformation to drive positive change in healthcare, in education, in transport and infrastructure, in governance and trade and justice, to make our societies more equal, more fair, healthier, more prosperous, more resilient, and more secure. We must talk about how it is only through the development and deployment of new technologies at scale that we can achieve carbon neutrality and avoid the worst aspects of climate change. And we must talk about how we can close the digital divide and close the gaping skills gap to ensure that the benefits of the technological change are felt fairly 
and equally by every region, every country, and every citizen, really leaving no one behind. Those of you who know the Commonwealth will understand that whilst we so often set an example to the world, we are not good about shouting about ourselves, what we've achieved, how we've achieved it. We tend to be quiet, we tend to be understated, and we tend quite often to be silent about how we have achieved things that other people think are unattainable and quite remarkable. And those of you who know me will understand that I love to build comity, not only between countries, but peoples and institutions and sectors. In Africa, apparently, I'm known as Mama Pro Bono. And that's because I'm full of woe and I have no money. But I'm also always looking for friends. Friends who are burdened with money, burdened with intellect, burdened with experience and expertise, and friends who are willing to share. And I know many of those friends are in this room tonight. And so let me invite you to unburden yourself of your wisdom, your knowledge, your expertise, and even if you are truly weighed down, please unburden yourself of your money. Because the Commonwealth together can do some remarkable things. And we will. Because we need today real concrete partnership. And that's what the Commonwealth has always been about. If you look at our charter, partnership is in the preamble. It says, we the people. We the people. And we need each other more today than ever before. We need to build real partnerships which will generate public good, not for ourselves simply, but for each other. And unless we do that, we will not be able to meet the challenges with which we are now faced. The Commonwealth has always led on partnership. It's leading still, and will continue to lead on this vital work. It is our modus operandi, our raison d'etre. And to know us is to understand that. And we have an ability to co-create the solutions that are needed for this very complex and challenging time in our world. And we can only do that by continuing to build the partnerships with our friends. And this is how real change is made. The partnerships we have with the UN, Antonio Guterres, with uh, Dr. Tedros, with um, Amina Mohammed, with uh, the, uh, the, the UNCTAD, with uh, Rebecca Greenspan, all of the memorandum of understanding we have with the development banks, the African Development Bank, the Caribbean Development Bank, all of these are essential partnerships if we are to deliver together. And this is what change looks like. We're no longer competing against each other. We're competing with each other to overcome the challenges we jointly face. And if we are not strong, we won't succeed. But the truth is, we are strong. We are resilient. We are determined. And we will succeed. And the history tells us that is who we are. In Kigali last June, our leaders, many of whom are great, not only in name, but in nature, 
focused on the transformative potential of technology for every sector and committed to addressing both the digital divide and the digital skills gap. And by the end of November, Commonwealth law ministers who met in Mauritius had agreed a paradigm shift in the delivery of justice throughout the Commonwealth, adopting a new frame framework which would harness technology and digitization to meet the challenges of today and tomorrow from the use of online hearings to clear close case law backlogs to the use of artificial intelligence to deliver dramatic improvements in the speed, access to, and quality of legal solutions. And soon, we are going to have the ability to have a framework legislation and regulation which will help us to better monitor the digital space. It is likely, once again, to be a first. And if R56 gets this right, and I reasonably anticipate they will, we will now have the global framework within our hands. And soon our Commonwealth health ministers, trade ministers, finance ministers, and education ministers will meet to debate and adopt similar shifts in their own sectors and collective efforts. And today, I had the privilege of speaking to the environmental minister here in um, Sri Lanka. And something tells me that we may be having an environmental minister's meeting to see how we deliver together on the 2030 agenda. And through our partnership with Simply Learn and Intel, we will be training tens of thousands of young people across the Commonwealth in digital skills and our officials, equipping them with the knowledge and confidence they need, not just to survive in a technological revolution, but to thrive in it indeed to shape it. And by the time we reach the next Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting next year in Samoa, we will have developed the world's most dynamic and comprehensive political and economic framework for harnessing the best of technological change to deliver real results for all our 56 countries that's the 2.5 billion people. A smart Commonwealth, a connected Commonwealth, an innovative, successful Commonwealth. Because of our natural advantages and unique blend of strengths, the Commonwealth is uniquely placed to achieve this. Because of our shared values and shared interests, because of our practical similarities in language, common law, regulatory coherence, business procedures, and large dynamic diaspora communities. And above all, because the values to which we all aspire, and these values of peace and justice, of tolerance, respect, and solidarity, and our role as the foremost international champion of small and vulnerable states, are an enduring responsibility. They express a vision for the world that will outlast all of us. They make us different. They make us special. I believe profoundly that taken together, they mean that the Commonwealth today in 2023 is not simply a part of the international system, it's a beacon within it. In the face of the poly crisis, it is our responsibility to ensure that we do not simply honor these values, but that we ensure we shape the choices we make in the face of profound global change and challenge. Because values matter most when they are put to the test. 
And I can tell you I'm extremely proud to be your Secretary General at this time in our history. I'm proud of what we've done. I'm proud of the sacrifice that so many have made to make a difference to those who are most in need. And I'm proud that the Commonwealth leaders were able to choose a girl from a small island state. My country of birth has only 72,000 people. So it's said when you have a Dominican in the room, you have a large percentage of my population. And I come from a very small village, St. Joseph in Dominica. One, as you've heard, of 12 children. I'm my parents' 10th only child because they said they only had one of each of us. Five girls and seven boys. I came into the Commonwealth born in 1955, although I'm only 21, at a time of division and change when being a woman meant that you had fewer prospects. Being black meant you had fewer still. Coming from the Caribbean meant you could play cricket. But in terms of opportunity, there was none. Who would have thought that that small child born in that tiny, fragile island in Dominica would end up being here today with you? And let me tell you why I think that's been so important. Because from my earliest years, I have loved this Commonwealth. As a child of the Commonwealth, born in the Caribbean, but growing up in the United Kingdom, I've seen the full panoply of who we are. I've seen the love, the difficulty, the trauma, and the courage that has taken us from where we were in the 1950s to where we are today. But not just that, I've seen where we're going, what we can achieve, what we can do together if we stay honest to our history and honest to our future. Please do not let anyone tell you that this polycrisis is too great for us. Nothing is too great for us if we choose to work together. And our Commonwealth has always chosen. We've never stepped away. We've never closed our eyes. We have always stood up and watched, seen, and we have delivered. And I can see it happening right here in Sri Lanka. Challenged, yes. Problems, yes. Determined, absolutely. Committed, you better believe it. And when we stand together, we will succeed. We used to say we have two choices. We can either swim together or drown separately. And trust me, I'm for swimming. So, as we swim together, I think there could be no greater service to the world and to the 1.5 billion people of the Commonwealth who are under the age of 30 than that we stand, we face the problems, and we fight. 2023 is the year of peace, the year of the Commonwealth, year of the youth, and it's also the 10th anniversary of the signing of the Commonwealth Charter. It is a unique chance, not only to renew our commitment to the values within it, but 
to bring those values alive in our work, there can be no better opportunity to ensuring that we do not simply re represent words on a page, but we turn it into lived experience for all, now and for the generation to come. These values are especially important in understanding, navigating, and harnessing the technological revolution. It is exciting and full of potential, but it is disruptive, and in the wrong hands, it is potentially dangerous. A scalpel can save a life, but it can also take it. And the Commonwealth's position as the first decisive multilateral mover on technology is not only an advantage to our member states, it's an advantage for the whole world. Because we can load the coming, transforming our lives, our values, which are unalienable, un uh, unshakable, generous, focused on the common good, bringing people together and drawing our strength. This is really our time. And Sri Lanka is an essential part of that. You have shown before that it's in, it is possible to inspire and to be inspired. And you have proven that it is not about being large. Your country is unique but it is the example you are able to set, that you set in the past, and I know you will set in the future. I believe that any nation which brings the values of the Commonwealth alive, no matter its size, can be strong and free and prosperous and fair and a force for good in the world. This is Sri Lanka's promise and the promise of the Commonwealth. And I suppose it's my job and my commitment as Secretary General to help you unlock that promise for the good of all Sri Lankans, for the good of the Commonwealth, and for the benefit of the world. And I promise you, whilst there is breath in my body, I will fight for this dream. All of you know I'm a practical dreamer. I want all my dreams to come true. So far, even things I never dreamt of have come true. And I know this Commonwealth has a long way to go. We will go together, we will arrive safely, and we will succeed. So, Bohama Ishsusi, Nandri, and thank you. Thank you, Commonwealth Secretary General, for your insightful lecture. It truly is always a pleasure to hear from you. I invite you to take a seat. And now I call upon Dr. Ganeshan Wignaraja, a board member of the Geopolitical Cartographer, to facilitate the discussion. Thank you, Secretary General. That was a really inspirational speech. Um, and I really liked the part that you said we must dream. And I think that was really wonderful. And also for reminding us of the role of the Commonwealth. I'd like to do this uh, question and answer session in two bits, if I may. The first bit, I thought we might have a conversation about some of the themes that you raised in your speech. Uh, just so that our public and our audience will get a better sense of the guts of what you're trying to say. And then we'll open it out to the audience to uh, be able to ask a few questions, but let you collectively take them so you can pick and choose a bit uh, as you like, if that's, if that's all right with you. Let me just start um, with this big issue that the geopolitical cartographer is worrying about, is the intensification of great power rivalries. And my question is, how does being part of the Commonwealth help uh, members, particularly a small country, uh, deal with this geopolitical context? 
Well, I think um, what we've seen is many of our small states, remember we have 33 small states, 25 of them are island states, Sri Lanka is one of them, feel that their voice is not easily heard. And in the arena where the elephants are fighting, those who are small tend to be crushed or go unseen. And what the Commonwealth has been able to do is to give our member states that voice. Many of our developing and smaller states have said on a number of occasions that in the global space, their economic position being weak, their numbers in terms of uh, population being small, it's very difficult to be heard, but it's very difficult even to have a conversation with some of the larger countries and their leaders. And it's quite remarkable to sit around the Commonwealth table. You will have a country like India representing 1.417 billion people speaking face to face around the same table with the president of a country as small as Nauru, which has 10,000 people. And they each have the same vote. So what that means is they get to listen to each other. And that's, I think, the reason why we've been able to craft some solutions which other entities have failed to do is because everyone is around that table. The big ones, the small ones, the squeezed ones in the middle, the developing countries, the developed countries, the rich, the poor, the black, the white, every religion, every race is represented. And I think that's the nature of the Commonwealth, which is absolutely unique. And they listen to each other. They actually listen to each other. Thank you. Let me shift gear a little bit. You, you talked about the polycrisis somewhat in socioeconomic terms, and it's certainly been terrible on the people of uh, the Commonwealth. Um, but I wonder, uh, how important is governance and peace um, in addressing the police crisis in Commonwealth countries? I think it's of critical importance because um, most of our member states, as rich as they may be, do not have enough money to deliver everything they need to deliver on the sustainable development goals. That's just the reality of where we are. It boils down to good governance. If you govern well, if you use your assets well, your opportunity to deliver more is enhanced. And that's why we spent almost two years working on the generally accepted performance management principles for government. And that's why I said it sounds boring, but it's actually absolutely critical. Because it's very difficult to get an objective assessment as to whether a country is doing good, bad, or indifferent, because quite often this judgment is made in the eye of the beholder. If I like you, I tell you you're doing well. If I don't like you, I might tell you you're doing badly. But where is the empirical data to demonstrate whether my assessment is right or wrong? So what we did, and it took us about two years, working with all of the Commonwealth um, senior officials, we had cabinet secretaries, um, directors in charge of performance management, we had permanent secretaries, and we wanted to define what does good governance look like? What are the standards? How are we going to judge it? And we created a performance management system which is accepted by all of our members to be a fair method to assess good governance. And that was agreed. We had a meeting where all the cabinet secretaries and, and, uh, who, uh, who, and delegated perm sex came. We agreed the performance management. And in June of last year, these standards, which will be the basis upon we, which we can help each other to do better, to assess accurately what we're doing, was accepted. And we are now going to take those generally accepted performance management principles, which is called the GAP, and we're going to share those with 
the UN, and I hope, just as with climate change and with loss and damage and the other things, we having done the back-breaking work of coming together and building this system, I hope it will be accepted by the UN, and that will be a means through which we can more effectively, more dynamically deliver what works on the uh, sustainable development goals so that we will live no one behind and we will have a fair, open, transparent system to really know whether our governments are doing what they promised and said on the tin. And some people think that's revolution. In your speech, uh, you talked a lot about climate, and I noticed you were talking about an environment minister's meeting and a climate finance advisor, if I got that right, yes. for Sri Lanka. Um, how would you assess how well the Commonwealth has done in climate? Is it a new area? Do you have plans for expansion? In fact, um, this is an area which the Commonwealth has been committed to since 1989. The first Commonwealth um, declaration on climate was in Langkawi. And that declaration makes extraordinarily sober reading. It says that if we do not address the issue of climate change, it will pose an existential threat to our world. And it then went out and enumerated the ways in which that would happen. And in effect, the first IPCC report was the report which was given to the Commonwealth. And the COP, the first COP, did not take place till three years after ours. And the Commonwealth has continued to fight hard on climate change since 1989. And the real reason is because those countries who are most adversely affected by climate change, who face this threat on a daily basis, are in our Commonwealth. If I just give you the example of my own country of birth, in 2015, we were faced with a tropical storm Erica wasn't even supposed to be a hurricane. We have 365 rivers in Dominica. Every single river broke its bank. And there was flooding and devastation and destruction of 95% of Dominica's GDP. Two years later, we were hit by the biggest hurricane the world had at that stage ever seen, Hurricane Maria. Hurricane Maria destroyed 226% of Dominica's um, GDP. 20% of the population had to leave the island. And if you went to my country, which is supposed to be green and called the Garden of Eden of the Caribbean, there wasn't even bark on the trees. It was brown, stripped bare, and there was a fear we would never recover. So climate change hit Sri Lanka. We saw the devastation of the tsunami, but we've seen flooding across Africa, across Asia. This reality means that it is an omnipresent threat for the majority of our countries. And that's why if you look at COP26, COP27, the countries who are really raising their voices on the environment were primarily countries from our Commonwealth family. And our solidarity on climate has been remarkable, but today it's needed more than ever. Thank you very much. Um, I will now open the floor for questions. And may I recognize Niranjan De Silva Diva Aditya to ask the first question, please. Uh, uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, congratulations on having this very well-informed grouping together. <coughs> Secretary General, you made a very moving speech. And actually, you actually, a very moving speech indeed. Now, as you know, I have been in the European Union for 20 years, the European Parliament, and I saw member states, 27 member states, coming into ever closer union. 
20 years ago when I joined the EU Parliament, we were not as close as we are now. And subsequently, seven treaties later, we have got many things in common and created out of a desperate 24 different countries with different languages and systems, what is now called the EU, which is at the moment the third largest economy in the world. As you know, it's got an attributes that I wanted. It's got a parliament, it's got a bank, it's got foreign services, it's got uh, a currency, it's got everything. That is basically a member state. Now, our charter, which is about 74 years old, I suppose, uh, is a static uh, piece of paper in the sense that it is not dynamic in the sense of the U European Union treaties. So uh, a group of friends of yours uh, have got together, as you know. Sorry, may I trouble you, please, to ask, ask a question, question yeah. sir, if you don't that's mind. That's right. you. A group of friends of yours have got together and uh, created what is called the Commonwealth Union to bring ever closer union of the Commonwealth countries in the same way that the EU countries came together. That is in order to support all the work you're doing. So how do we cooperate to make this happen faster? Well, the first Maybe thing... Shall I ask a couple more around and then we can give you a chance to answer. Are there any other questions? This is the last chance you'll have because we'll have to close the session soon. If there are any other questions, um, please... Sorry, please. We'll, could you just tell us who you are and then just wait for a mic, please. J just one sec, sir. Just one second. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ravana Vijaratna and my question goes back to the very question you asked, which is an important question, I believe. Uh, you mentioned them, the two elephants. Let's talk very openly. China and America and a lot of the countries in the Commonwealth are at a huge dilemma as to which way they go. And if they stay neutral, they're not even perceived as neutral. What can the Commonwealth do as a whole and under your leadership to guide them in a way that they can be neutral and still be safe? Are there any last questions that anyone would like to ask the Secretary General? Well, let, let me then add uh, one last question of my own. Um, so you talked a lot about the Commonwealth being a partnership and uh, a, a something very different to what it had originally been founded upon. Um, the question being asked sometimes in Sri Lanka and in other states is, is the Commonwealth still relevant um, in the reign of King Charles III. Um, his mother, of course, was a uh, different uh, personality and gave a lot of breath. And I would love to, we would all love to hear your views. Thank you so much. Um, well, the first thing uh, to say, and maybe I'll take them in reverse order, to say I think uh, the Commonwealth has never been more relevant than it is today. If it didn't exist, I think we'd have great difficulty in creating it because it's created in history a situation where it doesn't matter whether you're big or you're small, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, which geographical region you come from, you are bound by the same values and those values have created economic worth and real resilience. I think if you look at the aspirations that the leaders had in 1945 and then went on after the Second World War to create the Commonwealth, in, uh, the new Commonwealth in 1949, the aspirations for our Commonwealth are actually the same. It's how we have to migrate the solutions for the new 21st century that are different. We still want fairness. We still want justice. We still want good governance. We still want equity. All of those things are now taking place in a different paradigm. So what we're doing now is responding to the new pressures as opposed to changing the aspirations we had at the beginning. And the truth is that it is, of course, right that the 
new reign has started. But let's see what the leaders did when they decided to uh, elect, in effect, King Charles as the next head of the Commonwealth. It was based on not the fact that he was the heir to the throne, but on the basis of what he'd done for the last 50 years. So many people forget that he was the original climate change champion. Do you remember how people used to laugh about him talking to his plants? And the fact that he concentrated on dysfunctional young men with his work on the Prince's Trust. The fact that he wanted to promote sustainable development. All those issues were quintessentially Commonwealth issues. And so I think we have a new head of the Commonwealth who has probably had the longest apprenticeship known to man. And he's honed the skill and understanding. I think he's probably been to almost every country in our Commonwealth. He has grown up with many of our leaders. We've been blessed to the fact that the current uh, president of Sri Lanka, I think, has been prime minister six times. So he's well known <laughs> by everybody. And so these realities, I think, mean that we have stability, continuity, and a stronger platform than we would have perhaps if we had someone else. So I think the short answer, which is a long answer I've just given, <laughs> is that um, uh, we've never been more relevant. In terms of the elephants warring, this is another area which is so important for the function of our Commonwealth. We have disparate views. We've always had disparate views. The fact that we have one table around which we can discuss those disparate views means that we have always been able to come out with a consensus. And if you look at the Commonwealth um, communique in Kigali, there was a, clearly a very robust discussion, but in the end, there was consensus. And one of the reasons that so many countries are coming to our Commonwealth is that we are generally seen, if I can put it colloquially, as sane in an insane world. We are able to listen to each other, to understand the problems, and create the space that enables us to find peace and peaceful resolution of some of the very difficult problems. So these issues aren't easy. If they were easy, everybody would solve them quickly. But they're complex, and they're difficult, and they need discussion, they need comity, and they need debate. As to ever closer union, I think we are already extremely close. If you think about what we have in the Commonwealth, we are not bound by treaty. We're not a treaty-based organization. We're bound by values. We're bound by principles. We're bound by common purpose and common institutions. We have the common law. We have the common approach to government. We have a common language. We have common uh, institutions. All of those give us our advantage. In the European Union, one of the difficulties was that we had 28 countries with 24 different legal systems. There were so many difficulties trying to harmonize all those systems. We already have a harmonized legal system in our Commonwealth. We already have harmonized institutions, harmonized education, harmonized standards, and all that harmony gives us an ability to trade. We have more than three trillion trade within the Commonwealth, but the intra-Commonwealth trade is very interesting because we've never really exploited our intra-Commonwealth trade. 
And in 2015, when the Commonwealth, which is before I became Secretary General, did an analysis, they found that we had a 19% advantage. We called it the advantage when I came, but that advantage has now risen to 21%. What if by working together and having mirrored procedures, taking advantage of our common law principles, what if we can drive that up to 30%? So it's 30% cheaper, easier, faster to trade with each other than to trade with those outside our family. That's going to drive our economy. We're currently at $768 billion dollars of inter-commonwealth trade. By 2026, we hope to be at $1 trillion of inter-commonwealth trade. By 2030, we hope to be at $2 trillion. But think about what we have as an advantage. 21% of our member states are in Africa. Africa is going to be the source of the, four, the minerals of the fourth uh, industrial revolution. Africa has just agreed the African continental free trade area. If the principles and modalities of that continental free trade area are going to be based on common law principles and on a level of interoperability, then it is likely that that two trillion could be even greater. We have the WTO trade facilitation agreement. Because of the similarities between our legal systems, we can use uh, mirrored procedures to develop that trade. And Gose and I have just signed a memorandum of understanding. We are going to look at using our Commonwealth as the platform to explore what we can do to enhance the opportunities for trade and using those mirrored procedures. So I want all the help we can get from our lawyers, from our scientists to come together. And that's why I think we can do this. Digitalization is going to be our future. And we are going to have to train our children, not for the ed by using an educational system fit for the 19th century. Because if we do that, our children won't be able to meet the needs of the 21st century. So these are opportunities and challenge, and these are pressures. And that's why I say, remember, we are carbon. Our bodies, we are carbon. You put carbon under extreme pressure, and you create diamonds. So that's what we have to do. We have to take this difficult, stressful, complex polycrisis, and we have to turn it into diamonds. That's what our countries have done before. That's what our grandparents did. And that's what we must now do, this generation. This is our challenge. Thank you, Secretary General, for first speaking from the heart and giving us some hope and uh, encouraging us to dream and think outside the box. Um, let me hand over to Rishan. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, and I call upon Ms. Chitrangani Vageswar, board member of the Geopolitical Cartographer as well, to propose the vote of thanks. Honorable Raman Vikram Singh. President of the Democratic Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka, and Professor Maitri Vikramasinghe, the Right Honorable Patricia Scotland, Secretary General of the Commonwealth, Honorable Ministers, State Ministers, High Commissioners, Ambassadors, and other members of the Diplomatic Corps, officials from the government sector, members of the private sector, and all other distinguished guests. On behalf of the Geopolitical Cartographer, it is indeed my honor to propose the vote of thanks. We are honored and privileged to have Honorable Rani Vikram Singh, the President of Sri Lanka, attending this event. Your presence, sir, and the views expressed by you to this forum today demonstrate 
who are interested in understanding of the global issues and crises. The President spoke of the geopolitical cartographer and gave an overview of the new emerging global order and the importance of our region and the focus of the geopolitical cartographer. The President also briefly traced the importance of the Commonwealth, especially for Sri Lanka. We wish to thank our honoured guests, the Right Honourable Patricia Scotland, for agreeing to speak at this event on a very topical subject, the poly crisis and the relevance of the Commonwealth. We greatly appreciate, Madam, of, your, uh, of the, all the insights and the views expressed, uh, very frank views, and I think, as it was stated, it was very inspirational and also very moving. Uh, and I think also it was educative because uh, I think you spoke a lot of the Commonwealth activities, the programs, and the, and the projects that the Commonwealth undertake, which are, as you yourself stated, are, I think, not very well known. And uh, I think uh, it's up to the, uh, I'm sure with your leadership, uh, the Commonwealth is being steered to greater heights. At a time when Sri Lanka is facing many development challenges uh, that have to be dealt with on the domestic front, we at the same time need the understanding and support of the world. In this context, we consider the Commonwealth as an important institution, and I'm sure um, uh, the, you as the Commonwealth Secretary General will also support and uh, be with us at this time, at a time when we are going through many challenges. Uh, as you know, our commitment to the Commonwealth was demonstrated when we hosted the Chogam in Colombo in 2013. If uh, we are to pick up the central message that you conveyed to us today, uh, Secretary General, I wish to refer to your speech when you articulated a similar message on the global scenario at the Chogam in Rwanda in, 19, in 2022. And if I am to quote a few words from your speech, which sums up even the present, uh, present as well. I quote, the world is changing and the people are anxious, unquote. So it is a time that you, as a Communist Secretary General, and all the leaders in Sri Lanka, as our president mentioned, and the world that has to give the leadership and work, uh, face these challenges so that uh, uh, the, that it helps all our countries and the people. Uh, as the Communist Secretary General, you also uh, emphasized on the need to uphold the Commonwealth principles and values, principles of peace and justice, coexistence, freedom, democracy, unity, and diversity. And, and I think that is the glue that keeps the Commonwealth together. To, uh, because the Commonwealth is so diverse in terms of geography, race, ethnicity, and culture, and yet bonding together as equal nations with a common past. We are living in an interdependent world, and while the crisis would have, uh, which uh, has an impact on the entire world, directly or indirectly, we together have, as you mentioned, the ability and the capacity to meet these challenges. Uh, to conclude, uh, on behalf of the geopolitical cartographer, I wish to uh, thank, uh, it is my duty to express our thanks and support to everyone who supported us, helped us in numerous ways, uh, directly, indirectly, behind the scene, and of course, uh, I'm not mentioning any names or uh, names, but let me, of course, just uh, refer to uh, the um, the Marriott Hotel that has all, uh, helped us uh, and come out of the way to, uh, because you're, you're just, uh, I think, uh, operational only one month, but uh, I think you have done everything that we have asked for, so a big thank you to you. Uh, and last but not least, we wish to thank everyone uh, present here today 
for attending its function. We do appreciate your presence. Thank you. I now invite Mr. Mahinda Haradasa, Chairman of the Board, to present a token of appreciation to the Secretary General of the Commonwealth. Thank you all for joining us today. I invite you to join in for a light tea which is served just outside the ballroom. Thank you. <laughs>